see myself. So that's always a good thing. Um, welcome to season two, episode three, <clears throat> live from the drum room. Today I have two, two guys I had to call at the last minute because I couldn't get the guys I really wanted. Um, so I've got Steve Gadd and Rick Murata. I apologize in advance. It's probably not going to be that good or that funny or that exciting, but um, we're going to do the best we can. And seeing that we're actually on time, even a couple of minutes early, I'm going to release uh, the two of them from their uh, waiting room. Hang on a second. I'm going to get this queued up so I can see your questions. All right. Um, okay. Look at all these folks watching so far. This is great. Love it. I love it. Welcome, everybody. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's let's get right down to it. I'm going to bring the boys on in just a second. <clears throat> we'll have some fun today. Stand by. And without further ado, let me bring on Steve and Rick. Hey, here we go. Johnny. Steve-o. How you doing? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm good, good. Rick. Rick. Hey, we're all here. How's the nice. weather there? How's the weather in the vineyard? Oh, it's beautiful. It's 50 something degrees, gorgeous outside. And it's not too crowded, right? Oh man, that's beautiful. Are you right near the water? Yes. Oh, yeah. so, and the, the people, uh, it, get, it thins out, right? It's not as hectic. You no, know, uh, not this year. This year, a lot of people have stayed up. Some people are leaving like uh, this week and next week, but there's been an enormous amount of um, uh, people staying here and I don't, I'm staying right now. I, I don't blame anybody for staying. It's it's pretty safe here, knock wood, except for yesterday, my friend, the singer in our, the Murata Brothers band, Joanne Cassidy came over and we hadn't seen each other all summer. She came over and um, she then told me that she had just done a gig, a wedding gig with a bunch of people. Um, so I've been nervous ever since, but that's, that's it. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody. I haven't been around anybody, and it's not very crowded here. It's uh, it, it was really crowded all summer. It's yeah. it's more crowded than it than it normally would be, but it's not overly crowded right now. You guys haven't played though, right? The no. band. Rick, you know, I saw Joanne. I was out running. The only time I saw her the whole summer, a month or more ago, I was out running in Edgartown near where I live, and we passed each other and we stopped and chatted for a while. But it was. I'd never seen her running before. I think we run at different times. Of the she day runs usually. all the time. I think she was going to run 13 miles today. She's probably out running now. Hopefully yeah, I think, well, she. I thought she was going to join us, at least watch it. So hopefully we'll see her. She's an amazing singer, Steve. She is just fabulous. She's way too good for the Murata brothers. That's uh, true. Way, That's way too true. good. She's very true. Yeah. But so guys, what I wanted to do is... Uh, I made a couple of notes and I don't usually do that, but I didn't want to leave anything out. A um, couple of things I, I, I wanted I to just say, it was very brave of you to do, to try to put this thing together with a couple of rival. This is like a Trump Biden um, rivalry. Yeah, no, it's, it's bad. I know. That's the whole idea is I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring you guys together. I'm trying to, we might, we might interrupt each other and, talk over each other and contradict each other. Well, we would never do that. <laughs> there are a couple of stories <laughs> we have to get bring out. <laughs> the para Steve playing the paradiddle? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. I, 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 I do have to say that I watched Steve's interview, recent interview, which was really great. Really great. I, I, I don't agree with everything he says. But it was, I don't either. It was really good. But, <laughs> but watching him play those rudiments, in all seriousness, brought back so many memories 
And it was so brilliant to watch that and to wish, you know, that's the one thing that I, I, I feel remiss. I don't have that discipline to practice like Steve does because – and there are a lot of guys that are like that. I mean, I remember Andy Newmark practice all the time. A lot of guys <laughs> practice a lot, and I don't. And and uh, I was reminded of why I should when I was watching Steve do this stuff. And then I was reminded why I shouldn't because I can't do any of the things that I saw him doing. But I, re I had a memory of when we were real young, and I have no training whatsoever, and Steve is loaded with training. And we were working together a lot, and Steve was showing me stuff. And I remember he was showing me this one thing that he was playing. It's actually what, Steve, you called Mozambique, right? The, the thing you played on on um, Paul Simon. Uh, yeah. And Late in the evening? He, yeah. And he yeah. was showing me, and I was really not getting it. And he said, in his, in his inimitable way, whenever we would, he would show me anything, I would try to play it right away. And he would go, Slow down. You gotta walk before you can run. <laughs> play it slow. Play it slow. And then it'll come when you play it fast. And that was that's where I learned how to screw up things that I can't play is from Steve, because I try to play them really slow and then I never learn them. <laughs> well, all right. A <clears throat> couple of ground rules. I want to just start off with a couple of ground rules. Isn't it time for us to go already? I think we were done, didn't we? Well, Rick, it, it's, it's going to be, if you keep talking, it's going to be. <laughs> All right. Now, typically, you guys, the first things out of all you, both of your mouths is Steve wants to talk about Asia, how he played on Asia. You know, that's me on Asia. Did you know that? And Rick, you with, hey, that's me on Peg. Did you know that's me on Peg? Well, that's me on Peg. Steve, you know, when we're on the vineyard and he, we can't, get a reservation at a restaurant he'll tell the guy you know that song peg by steely dan that's actually me on that song and a lot of times it works we'll get a table but i'm just I telling you that's that out a lot i'm sick yeah. of myself actually and when steve and i were traveling on mission from gad we'd be on the bus at night eight hour bus ride and all he'd talk about was asia like did i tell you guys that i recorded asia let me tell you the story about it they put the chart in front of me. I read it down one time, one take. It's unbelievable. So we're not going to talk about that Every stuff time today. he's told me that story. Yeah. The two I love that. that story. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, a couple of people have mentioned this, and, and we sort of got into it the last time we all got together when it was Rick's interview and Steve sandbagged it, which I was it. one of the funniest ones ever. Um, start, we talked a lot, we, toward the end, we talked about you guys meeting in New York and, and how all that kind of came about playing together, double drums with John Trope and just, and, and I thought maybe that's something that you guys don't talk about a lot or aren't asked a lot, I should say. Um, so maybe you could talk about how you first met, how that sort of came about. I know there's a story how Rick, someone, was it, um, Oh, shit. Was it Hugh McCracken that said you should meet Steve Gadd? Dave, Dave Spinoza. Oh, so Spinoza. Okay. At the same time, three people called me at the same time. Dave Spinoza, Mike Maneri, and Tony Levin. And said, uh, Dave, Tony was really good friends with Steve before, and Mike Maneri as well, I believe. They had known each other for a long time, and I think Steve and Tony went to um, Eastman together. Did you, Steve? Yeah, we did. We went to Eastman together. Roommates, I think, right? No. And no. then when they came, when Steve was coming to New York, Dave, Dave had done something with him. And they all called me at the same time and said, you guys should be friends. I remember Mike Maneri as well. Mike, Tony, and uh, David all. And, um, and David, you know, Tony and, and, and Steve were, were so close. I think that Steve was living, I believe, up. Weren't you up in Woodstock with Tony, uh, near Tony or something? With the well, and it, when was when at the you know when I first met you, I think I was there. Yeah, I, I remember being up there, going up to Tony's and uh, hanging out with you and the family. It was I remember one very cold winter, snowy day, and um, we're we're all hanging out at Tony's house when Tony had that 
beagle, that dog. I think it was a beagle. Anyway, they were the ones that called me and they said, you should meet Steve. That's how I remember us getting together. But I had seen Steve before. I had seen, because Dave told me about him and Tony had told me about him. And I had you seen him. Didn't we meet at the club where you were playing with, uh, with that's the first time I remember seeing you. Maybe. I don't, I don't remember. You were probably really insignificant then. I thought you were just some guy who was trying to hang on and, and hang on, talk to me and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right? Did I kind of blow you off a bit? Did I just say, yeah, kid? Yeah, you know, I, had, I, if I kept on. I, I was persistent, though. On, on, uh, yeah. No, but, I, I think you actually remember that gig. And, uh, and oddly, Jerry had, yeah, that might be it. I, that, might be it. <laughs> that might be it. But I remember us hanging out, and I remember us talking on the phone, and I remember us hanging out at the uh, Jerry LaCroix session. I could still I remember you. I was in your apartment. I was at your apartment, too, man, in New York. Yeah. You were playing me, uh, played me the meters. I did? And yeah, Cabbage Alley, the stuff that you were, you know, some funk things that you were listening to. Oh. You played me some Keltner. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, because, and what was interesting for me, I mean, you know, did I you, had never. Did you I know never, Keltner I, before then? No. I never knew these guys. It was a whole different, uh, it was yeah. a whole thing for me getting into like um you know like the the groove world and and uh so it was it was great i mean i i you know absorbed it like a sponge man and it was like it was it helped me that was the helped me learn about you know like the groove listening to those guys but you no know, steve how I remember the first time that I heard of you, we found out later because Dave said to me, that's the same guy that was the drummer on how, if you weren't really, I know that you were playing a lot of jazz and that you were playing very legitimate stuff and big band stuff. But I remember Dave coming back from doing that gig with Marvin Gaye and they, and, and they used his band at the time. I think it was giant and the drummer, the way morning we're going to use the drummer wasn't even in the mix to to, to do it, uh, and they brought in it was in it was in Rochester I think, and they brought you in to play drums and I think you were with your dad. My dad um, took me, yeah. And and uh, and Dave said there was this kid he comes in with his dad he sits down and he went he goes Rick you wouldn't even have believed it it was the best stuff I ever heard in my life and this is before anybody this is before you were doing any nobody. I was, I was at East, you know, I was still in school. I was still oh, in I, school. And then, I, and, then I, and then I ran into David. So, yeah, I met David, you know, at that gig. Very short hair, right? Real, you know, and, and I mean, he was just all over the place, you know what I mean? And I, I, I'll never forget it. And then years later, we were on a date uh, doing a jingle. And something happened, but we, we sort of realized that we had met years before, and and at the and and he had was now like one of the busiest guitar players in town. He was doing a lot of sessions, mm. uh, um, doing producing, was an artist himself, and 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 you were in his band. So yep. I'm, I mean that's. So I just, yeah, you know, it was a learning, a, a great learning experience for me, man. And, uh, and it was fun playing the, the music that we played together, man. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But it was, a, it was kind of, that's how we, Steve and I met and we became instant friends and been family ever since. I mean, it's really been a really good close relationship. And the odd thing is that we're both drummers. We got to play together a lot in the early days. And whenever we could play together later on, like when we did the Groove All-Stars gigs and things like that, we would always play, you know, we would try to play together and always be playing jokes on each other. I mean, we've already <laughs> talked about the who can play quieter than the other guy. And then Steve just stopped playing, you know, <laughs> right. quieter than me. But, but we've always had that relationship. Never tell him 
Did we ever tell him about the, the, the time the manhole cover blew up underneath? Oh, oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> that's, I, yeah. That story, that's a Quentin Tarantino movie. Yeah, that's a story that I don't, I don't tell a lot of people out of respect for our, for our families, mostly your family. Yeah, I, I know. We don't. We, we have a history, but a manhole cover blew up on my way to Steve's in the middle of the night. I came from my house up, up in uh, Croton, New York, to go to Steve's house, and a manhole blew up cover blew up i still ended up at his place at like three in the morning hey, can i just say because i've heard the story that's the least crazy thing that happened that night. oh that was by far the least crazy thing the that least happened. crazy <clears throat> excuse me but you know Rick, I talk have... about you guys playing together talk about like what it was like because that's a question people ask and that's a question i would like to ask too is it's not easy to play with another drummer especially two busy guys like you guys trying mm -hmm. to play together huh. so no, but seriously, how, how, when you say busy, you mean that we both were working a lot with different exactly artists, we're <laughs> working a lot. Very, very simple. No, but but what was what was what was your thinking and what was your sort of mindset as you guys played? Did it just fall right in? I felt you know for me it was I mean when you're playing when you're playing with someone that you love the way they play that you love the feel, um, you know you just try to. You, you know, you've got that. You're in. I, I was inspired. You know what I mean to try and 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 lock into that kind of groove, and uh, and to make the thing. You know, to make it musical. So we weren't. You know, trying to play at the same time. So we were. You know. You know, trying to orchestrate the thing. So we each had a time to do it. And maybe sometimes we'd do something together. You know, but it was. It was, for me, it was fun because it was such a groove, you know, and yeah. uh, so it well, was, I, it was, I, it was um, always really fun for me too. I, you know, when I think back, there's times I've had to do, I never shied away from playing double drums. Like some guys I know don't like to do it at all, but they would do it, for example, with Steve. Um, or someone else, but and other guys like to do it a lot. I I never shied away from it. But when Steve and I were doing it, it, it sort of took on a different life. And I have to say, a lot of it was because we were such close friends. We really sort of admired each other's playing. I was a huge Steve Gadd fan, and I had to learn every day. It was really difficult, and um, we would. We would go, because we had such close mutual friends, I have to say there were times when, for example, John Trope said, I want to play with Steve Gadd, and I want to play with Rick Murata. So we're going to play, we're going to do a record, and we're going to tour with, <coughs> and Steve and I did that. And we had, everybody is so musical in that band, and bands that we were playing in, there was no time to fool around uh, being silly music. I mean, you when you were playing some of that stuff, it was, we were seriously trying to play really well. And the only time Steve and I ever, I always deferred to Steve. And the only time that we ever had disagreements was sometimes if things got too crazy, we would just, you know, have a discussion about it. And um, normally, in 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 good good terms, and we would you know not raising our voices, but once in a while, Steve can be excitable. I don't know if you know that he can he can get excitable, and <laughs> and, and uh, but we would we rarely rarely had problems. But most of the time, I remember we would play stuff, and we could. The interesting thing for me, and and I'll and I'll stop talking was. I was still experimenting. We were still experimenting and we would play. And sometimes Steve and I could play and we knew enough. This is what was interesting. We did a thing where we would start, if he started a fill, he would stop in the middle of the fill. And he, I could tell he's going, okay, finish that. And sometimes I would do the same thing and he would finish it. And there were times when it became so seamless and so great. And then we really started to 
play like like this together and really simple. It was never sort of like, it was never a contest because he was going to be, if it came down to chops and who could play fast and do all these rudiments and things like that, I lose. I it's, never lose. About, it's, not a, it's never about yeah. that. Yeah, it was never about that. I mean, and that's it. That's, that's, that's um, one of the highlights. So the, the one to end the whole thing is sometimes when I would play with another drummer and think that it was going to be that same way, it was sometimes not that. Mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. You have to be with a guy that wants to play together. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, right. I, I would spend a lot of time, you know, I would listen to, I was listening to what Rick was doing more than I was paying attention to what I was doing. You know what I mean? Because I want, <clears throat> and yeah. I'm sure Rick was doing the same thing back. You know what I mean? Yep. And uh, and the band, I mean, they were great times musically. We were young. The the industry was crazy. The on the on the on John's date he had like um, Richard T. or Grolnick, uh, Will Lee. You know, some of the great. I mean, these were players that it, were, it was a dream for me mm -hmm. to be able to play with those guys. For me you know? too. I mean, every day was like, in those years, every day was like going to school, you know, really was, you know, and um, so it was just, and I'm, I'm so happy that we've done it because uh, it's great memories, man. Yeah. yeah. Memories. You know, I've heard some of that stuff. Somebody, some, there's somebody posted some live some, something or other uh, over the last year or every once in a while I hear something where somebody bootlegged some sort of Mikel's we used to play Mikel's um, yeah. with that band you know we've done gigs with that band but we played Mikel's um, I remember playing there a few times and Steve and I were set up and there was such a small place and the band was so big and I remember there was a back door entrance and the door was open and I was sitting back way back there and Steve and I were almost out in the street and it was just it was really great reminiscent and when we played there I mean Mikel's was those gigs were so much fun because they were hanging from the rafters there was so yeah. there were, you couldn't walk in the place you couldn't get through the place and Will jumping around and 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 Spinoza and and Trope on stage and the Brecker brothers playing the horns it was Randy Michael and uh, Dave Sanborn Right? Yeah, I think Alan Rubin was there too. I think Alan, Alan Rubin, maybe Marvin Stam. I mean, these, it was crazy, crazy good, good Great band. players. Always, always unbelievable musicians, man. By the way, Will, Will is watching uh, and he sends his love to everybody. And okay. he's having dinner in the south of France right now, um, but he sends his love. Seriously. Yeah, he's been in France, man, for. He, after last March, he after the Love Rocks thing in New York, that benefit that he MDs, he went to uh, St. Bart's because they, they, you know, they were closing down New York and everything. So March yeah. 13th, I think he went to St. Bart's, and then from there, his mom, his mother-in-law, um, has a place in the south of France. So. <laughs> he went from St. Bart's to the south of France. He's waiting for the numbers to go down, you know? Good for him. That's yeah. like in the vineyard. Yeah. I'll tell you something about Will. I hope he's watching because I was going to write him, uh, a text him or email him. <coughs> I saw a post that he did the other day about James Jameson. It was so amazingly good. It's about a documentary about session men, but it was Will talking about James Jameson playing this bass part on a Marvin Gaye song and then playing it, heard it through the grapevine, was it? And then played the same part and he's, and he's emulating Jameson on a Gladys Knight and the Pips. And I was just, my jaw dropped. I mean, it was, the, it was really interesting. <coughs> I think I those things and it don't make sense, but that was so good. And he did such an incredible job. And I realized he should have his own show. Yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's good to be Will Lee. <coughs> Let's face it. But you know, and and just to just to put a, a cap on that last
conversation. I was just going to say, just knowing you guys and watching you guys all these years, I, what you both said, I was thinking it at the exact same moment that listening to each other, which, which seems so obvious, but it's something that some people kind of don't think to do, but that, that, that's the key with the way both of you guys play, whether you're playing together or with other musicians, it's like, you're both great listeners. It's, it's you're even if you don't even realize you're listening, you're listening, you're, you're absorbing it. You're thinking more about what the other guy's doing than what you're doing. And, and, uh, and it shows, it shows the way you guys play together. It's amazing. It's like, it's so natural. And Nick Vincent, um, <clears throat> asked about the song Vengeance by Carly Simon. And I thought that was, is that both of you guys? I, I thought it was just Steve. I don't is it know. Both? I don't know. I, I remember we did stuff together with Carly, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> actually, the session was <laughs> the day after that night that is- The infamous night. The, the Are you kidding? Conference. No, that we had a date the next day together. We went from my house to the date at Atlantic. <laughs> Oh my and God. That's exactly right. I was thinking I, exactly the same thing. There was a picture of you and I in the studio with our arms around each other that morning. Remember that picture? We yes, had? yes. Um, oh boy. I, I bet you didn't get much I, sleep that night. No. no. But I don't remember uh, what songs we did together, you know? No, neither of us would remember what songs we did together. But it's amazing that we both remember we went from your place right to that place. Well, I'm going to look that up when we're done. <clears throat> maybe it'll maybe it'll have it. Carly, Carly Simon and Arlene Listen. Rothberg were both there, and we walked into the session, and they both. I remember when Steve and I walked in. Carly and Arlene, who I adore both of them, went, looked at us and went. Uh, they were just looking at us like, um, is everything okay with you guys? Because. <laughs> We look like we've been through a war. It's not every night you get a manhole cover blows the door off, literally blows the door off your van, and then oh. you go through a worse night, crazier. <laughs> night like that. Um, oh man! I recently, you, know, I, you know what? Those were good times. Those were great. The city was so great back then, and yeah, you well. know, and you, the sessions. Most of the sessions were you know, were live, so you'd be, you know, some of the horn players were, were guys that I had heard about growing up, you know, it was like everything was inspiring. You wanted to sound good for the, for the artist, but you were, you know, I was in awe of some of the musicians that were on the session, so you're, you want to, you know, you, you want everything to be good, you know what I mean? It was such an inspiring time. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, man. It really was. We did, we didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, unbelievable. You know why? Yeah. Looking back, yeah. is, is, hindsight is, is, is kind of uh, being retrospective and nostalgic about it. Is is, is brighter and easier because I, I, for me, for me, we were so busy back then um, that you didn't get a chance to stop and smell the roses and really appreciate it. But you realized what Steve said is exactly true. I remember walking into sessions. I remember walking into commercials that I was doing like jingles and looking around at the band and saying to myself, you can't put a band together like this to do an album. And these guys, we're going to play together for one hour and it's going to be great. And you're, 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 you're just in, 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 in awe of these guys. We used to go from there to McKell's, do our gig at McKell's, be up almost all night long at McKell's, and the same guys at McKell's would be on the session at 9 or 10 o'clock the next morning. And all, it yeah. was just a continuous, seamless thing of music. And, and back then, for me, it got to be almost painful because I just couldn't keep up. But when you look back, it was really unbelievable. I mean, when you think about playing with Mike Brecker, Randy Brecker, Dave Sanborn, and um, the bone player in the Brecker Brothers Band. Barry Rogers. Barry Rogers. who Barry taught me how to phrase Latin music. You know, he would come and hit my chest. 
for phrasing, you know, for when they would play these figures and stuff like that. I mean, that was like, like Steve said, that was school. That was school for me between Spinoza, Barry Rogers, those guys. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Barry did all of the Latin band stuff, trombone stuff for years. He, I mean, he was unbelievable, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> he had that stuff down. So there were all, you know, all different kinds of players, you know, whose expertise were in different areas and everyone just shared everything. You know, it was, uh, it, it was like a big party, man, for in the 70s. Yeah. Hey, of- I, speaking of those, those records in those days, the great Jack <laughs> Douglas just made a comment. Love both of you guys. We did some great sessions. So I know you guys... Yeah, work with Jack, Jack and Jack was when I did John Lennon. He was we did a bunch of stuff, but I remember Jack was in the room. He was doing the John Lennon records, what the the record that I played on, and um, Jack's great. He was great, legendary. I was watching the Lennon thing last night. I, there was a Lennon thing on TV last night. I saw Jack. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, a, a, a brand new one, right, for the 40th anniversary, and yeah, yeah. So I mean that was we're Double talking fantasy. about we're talking about the period we're talking about is that period you know what I mean yeah all yeah that stuff, you know not you know re- those kind of albums were being done yeah live live records live drums yeah I know. You know, Everybody can I, in the can room. I, tell, I want to tell one quick story. I don't know if I've told it before. I, I just like to every once in a while, I remember, I may have said this before. I might have told the story before. Just a real quick one. So Steve, is a, he liked to, as, as, as influential, as inspiring as he was to me, he also didn't mind throwing me under the bus. And there was one particular uh, time when he was playing with Bill Watrous's big band. And um, Bill Watrous was an incredible b- trombone player, and he had this amazing, it came to mind when we were talking about Barry Rogers. So Bill Watrous, bone player, famous jazz bone player, really, really good. We did a lot of gigs and jingles and things like that together. And Watrous, great guy, a real old jazz jazzer guy, and Steve's playing in the big band. I have no big band chops at all. At the time, it was like, that was just not my forte. R&B, 10-piece band, yes. But jazz, swing, big band, I didn't know what I was doing. And Steve, Bill, Bill said to me, Rick, you got to do some of these gigs. You got to do these. No, yeah, Bill, no, I'm, I'm not, it's just a... So one day, Steve calls me. He goes, listen, I can't make these rehearsals. Just do the rehearsals for these gigs for me with Watrous's band. And, and, and I said, oh, I don't know. And then Bill calls me. He goes, Rick, come on, it's Steve said it'll be easy for you. I play with you all the time. It's going to be great. So I go and I do this rehearsal to say that the entire rehearsal, maybe I did two days of rehearsals. Steve couldn't do them. Was the entire band spent most of the time talking about how funny and awful it was to try, to listen to me, to try to play this stuff, but mostly how badly I was at reading the charts. There was one specific chart we're playing, and I'm just like, you know, I'm yeah, well, it's yeah. it's big band, all these big band hits. I'm playing swing kind of thing, but then the whole band looks at you when they play a figure, and you're somewhere totally different on the chart. So, <laughs> Watrous, who was who was just a funny old time bebop guy comes over to me and he's lap, you know, he was totally good humor. He was really appreciative. It was basically, I was just marking time. I was just playing time for them most of the time because it was obvious I wasn't going to be making these hits if I made any of them. It was just like horrible. But watch this comes over to me and he goes, Rick, I got to show you something funny. And he takes the chart and he says, we were playing with Gad. And when Steve plays, everybody comments, he reads like, like a trumpet player. He never, ever makes a mistake. Because I heard him in his interview talking about how reading, you know, oh, I was, wasn't the greatest reader. He's one of the best readers I ever saw in yeah. my life. He said, so they, he goes, see on this chart here, we were playing this song one night, and one day, all of a sudden, Steve's completely lost. And we're all playing, and he goes, it really made me happy 
to finally see Gad make a mistake. <laughs> Did I ever tell you the story? And he no. walked over. To the, he walked over to Steve to say, "Steve, what happened to you? This, we were you were completely wrong. You were lost right around here." And he looks at the chart, and this is no lie. He looks at the chart, and whoever had played, you know, the charts went with the band. Someone dropped like a drop of water, fell <laughs> in a quarter note, and turned it into an eighth note. And Steve was an eighth note ahead of the band for the rest of the chart, but played it perfectly. <laughs> now, now, the end of the story is Steve, I am sure, knew after a few bars that he was an eighth note ahead. But he refused to go back. <laughs> he was reading the chart, man. Yeah. Because he was not going to not read the chart. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's I never a, heard that that's story. A, that's I never heard true. that story either. That's the true, true, true story. Steve, you have to remember that Watchers came up to you one day and there, there was a flag on, on, a, on, a, on a quarter note that turned into an eighth note and you read it as an eighth note and played the rest of the song an eighth note off. He said every hit we made, he was making an eighth note ahead of us. So we would, he would go, da -da -da, and we go, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, the, 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 it was big band stuff that was like this. You know, it wasn't all this slow little elephant barrel ballads. Uh, uh, That's uh, one of the buses he threw me under, by the way. That is great. Well, this is this is a question. That, it's kind of for both of you guys. That, that um, and he, and because we're not doing the Asia the. the Typical Asia question. We'll, we'll do this one that gets asked a lot. But uh, Mark Tirabasi, I think that's who asked this question, asked Steve about the um, Ricky, Lo Ricky Lee Jones tune, Chucky's in Love, and the paradiddle uh, groove that you play and how you came up with that. <clears throat> so that's kind of an. Steve, I think you should plead the fifth on this. I don't think you should talk. <laughs> it's a good segue. I don't think he should talk about it. I think he should just keep it to himself. Uh, uh, you know, I just, I was just trying to play the music, you know what I mean? I, I, uh, you know, like th those years for me, there was a lot of different kinds of, uh, music being recorded. And, um, the thing about coming from, a from a jazz background is you got a lot of, you know, little technical things you can do and you're, you're constantly trying to figure out, you know, how to play around one, you know what I mean? So, you know, I would practice little, you know, little technical things. And, um, and sometimes on, on the, on the uh, recording sessions that weren't jazz, that were more pop, there were spaces where maybe I could try a little bit of a tricky thing. Um, and, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And that's what, what, what happened with that film and Chucky's in love. I mean, it was, that's like a sort of like a jazz thing that I, you know, would do when, when I was playing straight ahead, but it also worked as a fill in that song. So that's what I remember about that. Very memorable, Phil. Yeah. And I remember that, Phil, really well. Really well, I remember that. <laughs> I hear it now. I actually can hear it now. It's almost like I played it before. I... <laughs> um, for both of you guys, this is the question I'm going to ask you. For both of you guys, when you, to, to Steve's, um, Oh, we have, hang on a second. And to Steve's point, um, were you guys often given some free reign to do that, to, to like come up with, with your own kind of shit in a place like that? Like, um, it was, I mean, it was just, it was a place for a fill and that's, that's what I chose to play. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, you Look know. Look who's joining hey, us. Hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> Surprise! Well, I don't want to spoil the party. Oh, this I is just so want to, good. 
I just chimed in so I could listen a little closer. Oh, this is too good. This is Will too Lee, good. everybody, from the south of France. I texted Will and said, come on in. And he said, I'm having dinner in the south of France. So oh. I was so tempted to uh, just to say hello to you guys that I, I that you brought me right back to all those great moments of you two guys playing together. And e either one of you two guys are guys that like you have such great instincts and all that stuff. But for a bass player, I can I can think of, a, you know, I've told this story a, a bunch of times about both of you guys, either of you guys were, were like, I, you know, you'd be in a room and somebody would have a song and you had to think of something to play. And I just couldn't come up with a part. But when either of you guys start to lay it down, it, the part just played itself always that's something that you two guys have in common so having said that the other thing that that's 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 incredible about the combination of you guys is like normally it's a, a bass player's nightmare when two drummers are, are are seated in a room together and you're supposed to figure out okay what what do you do because the the goal is to play with with like the foot the foot but when there's two feet happening, <laughs> one of two things has to happen. Either there has to be an uncanny amount of space being left by one of those guys, which both of you guys had this, this great dynamic when you did play together that you left plenty of space for the other guy. To, and you, you addressed that earlier when you were talking about the fills and all that stuff. Like one guy would sneeze and the other guy would say bless you one guy would fart and the other guy would, excuse me you know but it was kind of like that dynamic playing with you guys and when you did play together it wasn't a plan it was it always felt really really good so that was like a miraculous pairing that whoever f first thought of you know i think it was trope because he liked to have a lot of everything right give me two you know, two bazooka players. Give me two, uh, you know, gotta have, gotta have a bunch of horns up there. You know, he was the guy who never made a penny because he would always hire like way too many horn players. He heard it in his head. He had the sound in his head and he had the sound of you two guys playing in his in his mind. And he, he made it happen. And like you said, there was no room at, on the stage at McKell's. They had to build a wing, an extra piece of stage that they, they named the John Trope Memorial Wing. <laughs> but that was the only way to get all those characters up there at once and you know, those were so great i could still feel it and i could still see you up there on stage i could you still, too i could still see it i could feel and it. george young and all the guys you know oh, it was so great. yeah what a band oh my god the best guy Bill, thanks for posting that thing the other day that I saw you do, by the way. I really want to say it again. That thing you did on James Jameson was so brilliant and just so great. You know, I, I kind of I, really, I don't remember even doing it really. It was a while ago. And um, I found it somewhere. And the guy that was doing it, uh, I hope he's still with us, but I have a feeling he was the guy putting together a a uh, a, a, about session musicians, some kind of a documentary about session players. Yeah. And, and um, I don't think it ever got finished. It was called Session Men or something, but you're, it was so well done. The production was so good. And the bass sound, the sound and your playing on it was just, and the explanation, it was, it was music school. So hey, man, how can we get it? Can we still, can we get it online? It's, it was just on YouTube. YouTube? And, you know, oh, <clears throat> From the same series, there's a bunch of other guys doing interviews too. I think Waddy, Waddy's doing, did one, Jim Horn and some guys, you know, some of the Wrecking Crew guys maybe too. So I have to look for it on YouTube. Yeah. I love things like that. Cause you know, these are my, these are my cats, man. You know, these are our, <laughs> these are our peers. These are our guys, you know, talking about stuff. Yeah. Like, did you ever see the making of Asia? There's a whole thing about Steve Gadd, man. And Steve, let's get into it. <laughs> that one fill in bar 39. No, just kidding. <laughs> but I have to say, what, what 
was it two years ago that Fagan was on the Love Rocks concert? Yeah. And um, Steve, you're such a professional. I mean, everybody knew, first of all, I had this idea, okay, I got Steve and I got Fagan on the same stage. What if, and you know where this is going. So sure enough, everybody agreed to do Asia, you know, both Steve and, and I, and I made sure everybody was cool first. I wasn't going to just say, okay, we're doing Asia. Two, three, four. It was just like, uh, you know, Fagan was cool and he trusted the band. I told him Steve was on the gig, you know, kind of like what Herbie Mann used to do. He'd call you up. <laughs> Before he would even call Steve, he would say, yeah, Steve's on the gig. And he'd call Steve, yeah, Will's on the gig. <laughs> you know. Rick, you know that we've done that together. Oh, of course. <laughs> Robin Alberian's on the gig. Oh, sure. I'll take it. <laughs> and um, so it was it was a coup to get to get that to redo, to reenact basically Asia with with, with those guys. It was just incredible. Oh, Steve, awesome. Steve worked so hard, man, because you Steve, you you knew the pressure was on. You knew that everybody expected to hear that record and, and Steve you know, he doesn't live, relive his sessions, you know, none of us do. But Steve was, Steve, you spent so much time like getting it together, man. I re I'll never, I'll never be I able to thank you enough. I did, yeah. <laughs> and, boy, what a, and what a payoff. Yeah, and that, and that'll, that'll, that's probably the last time I'll ever play that song. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I'm sick of that song. You know, I, I like to talk about it. I tell you the truth. I think being more honest about it, I think Steve's more accustomed to these things. I heard rumors. I mean, Carol, I was talking to Carol one day and she told me that she, he actually has a place in the house where he sits down and he practices being interviewed like Rupert Pupkin. And he'll sit there and he'll say, yeah, I remember uh, on uh, Chucky's and Love, I remember Ricky <laughs> Jones and I, no, 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 that was when I was playing with Steely Dan. So he knows, that's why he's so good at, at, at interviews. He's just- it's like the debates. It's like practicing yeah. the debates, yeah. getting ready for the- Rolls off his thumb. Righty, I'm right, yeah, I, I practice with uh, my dog, my, my, my little dog. <laughs> <laughs> Him and I. <laughs> hey man, I don't want to take up this interview. I want to get off, but I love you guys so much. Thank you, John. Well, it's great to see you. I really oh, you're welcome, it. Lee. Thank uh, you for joining Sandrine. us. Well, say hello to Sandrine. And We're going to watch yeah. the rest of you guys because I love you so much. Give her the oh, give her our best. Thanks, man. Thanks, Will. Big that love, Will. Treat. See, you. yeah, awesome. Treat. I'll tell you, that's one of the reasons I like doing these John the Christopher things because you never know who's going to pop up. Like I remember the first one I did, and then Steve Gadd showed up and ruined the day, and now we got yeah. Will. Hang on, I got I got to let Ringo and Charlie Watts in the room. Hold on a second, let me just—they've been waiting. Well, they want me to get off. If it's Ringo and Charlie, <laughs> they want me to leave so they can talk to Steve. Uh, <laughs> no, that was great. That was a nice treat. Nice of them to to uh, to join us for a minute. Yeah, and I, I got a couple more things I want to just talk about here, guys, and then we're gonna freelance. And I'm gonna, I'm not gonna keep you guys on for a long time because, Rick, I know you got a lot to do today. There's leaves to be raked. Well, yes, I can. just want you to know that I, I do want to mention one thing. I was so inspired. I was so inspired from watching Steve's last interview when he did all that stuff where he's showing people about rudiments and he's got he's teaching. So I decided that I'm going to start teaching, but I didn't know exactly what I should start. So I've been working a lot with Milo on the <laughs> math book. So when I was sick, Milo boards sent me the math, my workbook. So there's some dominoes. That's really good, Rick. This Did you write that yourself? Five E one five. No, this is Milo's writing. This is my. Oh, book. I thought it was your writing. Milo boards did this. But the other thing I'm going to be teaching soon is how to tell time. So if it's five o'clock, the little hand is on the five, the big hand is on the 12. See okay. what time it is? Uh, wait a minute, let me figure that out. So I have um, it set up so I know when this interview is gonna be over. I see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, well, the other
other day, a good friend of mine, Mike Rogello, who I think is watching right now. Uh, Rick, you met him last year in Portsmouth. I was just going to go like this at a certain time. I was yeah. going <laughs> to. Time to go. Now, sorry, go ahead. Say, say what no, you so, so my friend Mike Rogello, drummer here in, in the Boston area, great drummer and a great singer and a great guy, um, wanted to ask a question that's a really good question that he said, you know, his, he basically to set this up, He's a working drummer, plays every week in his band, but because of COVID, none of us have worked in, you know, eight months now. <clears throat> and he said, I've really kind of, I, I sat down to play the other day and I had no technique and, you know, I, I, I just felt like I need something to motivate me. So he wanted me to ask you guys what ideas or suggestions you might have for kind of staying in shape during this time when you can't get out and play in a band, but you know, you want to try to maintain some level of, of, uh, I know this is really a serious question too. I'm not, I'm not going to, it's not a, not a funny punchline, like try to maintain some level of technique, um, and stay motivated doing it. And Steve, this, this is a good segue for you to talk about your book in a minute. Cause I want to make sure we talk about that, but, um, but just any thoughts you guys have on, on practicing and just, you know. I got to defer to Steve on this. He's brilliant at this stuff. I'll, uh, so I don't, I mean, I don't normally practice, uh, you know, we're working. So, I mean, playing is what keeps me in shape and, and I warm up before the gigs and stuff like that. But, you know, if I'm working a lot, I really don't have the time to practice. And when I have time off, I'd really, the last thing I want to do is I want to just clear my head. But in the time of COVID, um, what I, I just, I, I gravitated towards, you know, playing rudiments, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I did when I was a kid. <clears throat> and uh, and what's, what's good about that for me is I can do it. I don't have to be at, at a set of drums to do it. You could do it anywhere. You could, you know, do it on your, on your shoe or on a, you know, and, and I ended up, I mean, I ended up spending a lot of time playing rudimental stuff, not because I wanted to practice, just, just because it, it, I, it opened the door and I, I got back into it. So yeah. for me, that was good to keep my hands, you know, to keep them loose. Um, I think the other thing that's important is exercise, um, and uh, and I think that you know if you're away from the kit for a while, you know it's probably going to feel a little awkward. Uh, not only what you're doing, but trying to be able to relate to other people. It's going to take a minute to get back into that, but uh, I think if you you know, if you just keep your hand, if you move your hands every day, um, if you can do it with a set of drums, you know, great. If if not, you know, just do it on on a on a pad or something. Just you know, play a little every day. Uh, and I think exercise is real important mm -hmm. to keep you on a on a good level um, to to be ready for any kind of gig. You know, Are but you there's going to be. I did. I did used to do Pilates. I haven't done it since the uh, pandemic. Um, but uh, yeah, I, exercise is. Uh, I think is real important to keep yourself on a certain level for different gigs. And then you know, and then you just got to go through that that period of trying to get back into it. We all have to go through that. You know, you put your mind plays tricks on you. Geez, that feels weird. I haven't done this in a while. You know what I mean? But your mind is going to tell you that before you even do it. You know, yeah. that's the way, that's the way our minds work. So you just got to go through it. Um, and that's just what I've been doing. Joanne Cassidy's keep Rick. Cassidy says, keep Rick from teaching children at all costs, please. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we're going to get Joanne on the show. I think we have to do oh, that. Oh, no, she, I'm, I'm out. If she's on, I'm out. She will have us all cracking up. 
She is a cut up. She she is. Well, that's no, Steve. Thank you. That's that's great. That's that's great advice and great information. And um, and and just to talk a little bit more about that, so everybody knows, Steve's been working on a book, uh, a, an exercise, basically of exercises, <clears throat> rudimental exercises, and hopefully it's going to be out end of the year or next year. It's still. Yeah, it's it's just the th I just started documenting some of the things that I that I started to fall into because I, I thought they were interesting. There were some different takes on on old rudiments, and um, I just wanted I, as I was as I was uh, um, figuring the stuff out. Uh, I wanted to you know share it so. Hopefully, you know, you know what would be interesting is one of the things for me is with rudiments, there's guys that are that are brilliant at doing rudiments and they can sit down and read the rudiments and they can fly through them like Vinny, you, uh, Keith Carlock, guys like that. But then there are guys that aren't so smart, like all the other people that I know. And maybe it'd be nice if you had in your book, is it just written out? Are the rudiments just written? Or it'd be great if you like had a thing where the rudiments are written and then you go to YouTube or you get a DVD or something where you go and there's you doing the rudiment really uh, slowly to show, because sometimes reading, looking no, at the yeah, rudiments no. and going right, left, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, right, left is just yeah, a pain yeah. in the ass. There will, we have it. There will be. I, 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 I want to put a, uh, a DVD with it, you know what I mean? So it can be, so you could see this stuff. Yeah. And, it is, and it isn't all the rudiments. It's like, there's like a lot of rudiments with flams, like flam taps, flam paradiddles. I saw that. I saw when you were doing that and that it was really great to watch and see you do it. It's a great exercise, but those are exercises. Yeah, they're, and, and, and they're in phrases, um, so they challenge you uh, oh, technically. They strengthen your hands. I think they're they're good because they're in phrases, so it's musical. And you could do them with a metronome, so you're working on the technique. You're working on your time. It's 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 musical because it's in phrases. So, and I just uh, I just was it just happened. You know what I mean? I, it just happened, and I got into it and. And I had the time to write some of the stuff down. So I'm looking forward to share it. That's great. And and <clears throat> there's talk of, of maybe doing something through drum channel. To your point, Rick, exactly to, to have it, you know, in that format, in a DVD format, downloadable or whatever, so that people can see him demonstrating it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm good with I always like the slow visual like I was I mentioned it early because it came back to me that when I was watching Steve's interview and he was going through a lot of rudiments and I and and I was thinking back to honestly, it made me hearken back to when Steve and I were working together or we just hung out together all the time. We talked a lot about drums. We were always hanging out together. It was always stuff and showing him me stuff and and it was always slow and I would watch him play it and then do it. But with rudiments, I know the story about, I always stuck in my mind when we were talking about rudiments and one day Steve said to me, yeah, when he, he was talking to a buddy of his where he said when we were in school, he got so good at rudiments or bored with it that they would, Steve, make sure I'm right about this. You guys would do them where you would do the right hand or one hand and he would do the other hand and you would do rudiments like together, only one hand at a time, doing the opposite sticking. Right, right. Those were those were the guys in drum corps. And Stan, I would play the left hand, and and I and I'd have my the guy would be standing here. I'd have my hand on his back. I'd be playing the right hand on his back. He'd have his left hand on my back. Oh, oh, oh. Hand, playing the right stick over here. We played, you know, so much together and 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 worked on the rudiments so uh, so much that we could sound like one guy. Two guys. That's, that's how, and it was so much fun, though. I mean, 
I, you know, when I was playing the rudiments, I was hanging with guys like I was hanging with you guys that loved to just do that. And they were, they were, you know, they couldn't wait to, for you to come up with something new and, and learn it and do it together and then show the other guys. I mean, it was, it was so much fun. And, and then, you know, and, and then I, when I ran into you, it was like, I, I was like doing it with you, but with other kinds of, uh, with other kinds of playing, but it's so much, it's so gr gratifying to be able to have a friend, someone that you love the way they play, take the time to show you stuff and, and, and f want you to show them stuff. I mean, it's, it's a great way to learn. And, uh. So, and it still is. I still like, I still love that today. I, I love it when two drummers play, you know, together and a lot of times play the same thing. You know what I mean? Just, you know what I mean? It gets powerful. Just lock in and yeah. Yeah, yeah. It really is. A, it's a treat. Yeah. I've been playing a lot with Jerry, as you know, John. And Jerry... realize but Jerry when we first did it Jerry was not crazy about playing two two drummers double drums but we we get on doing it really well and I'm so yeah. used to being taking a back seat or I don't have that problem we don't have those kind of ego problems I I I, I, I like it too I love I, I really do like playing double drums part of the reason is I'm lazy but like Jerry Jerry's got a great groove too man oh yeah yeah yeah, I, and, yeah. And I remember when we, the three of us did something at one of the groove nights. Yeah. I mean, it was like playing with two of you, you know what I you mean? Know, like you you know what's interesting? What's interesting about Jerry is you could have three drummers playing, right? And you know, Jerry will play, he, he will definitely play something you're not playing. So mm -hmm. if you're playing double drums with Jerry, Jerry will play something you're not playing. There's times when you're playing, like Steve and I would play, we might be looking at each other and we're playing a groove and we're just grooving, playing together, right? But you could add Jerry and Jerry would be playing something else that would fit, totally fit. Yeah. He's very percussive. I noticed that yes. when you guys play together. He, yeah. He'll be playing the straight groove and Jerry will pick up a tambourine and, yeah. and play something here and play yeah. the tambourine. Yeah. You know, when I first heard him playing on, <clears throat> I once to, when he was playing with Peter Gabriel on, on Peter Gabriel's album, I just thought, this is crazy. No hi-hats, he's playing the whole, the, the kit. He plays the kit like this. Like I play the kit like this. Mm. He plays the kit like this. He starts here. So I was listening to this one song he did with um, the Indigo Girls called Galileo. Galileo? And I went to see him play it live and I'm like, God, he came up with so many different things. He was playing this wooden thing here, playing this little melody part yeah. here, and then he goes over here, and he's never he's playing all around the drums, but it never sounds busy. And if you're going to play with more than one drummer, you got to know how to do that. You got to know yeah. how to play yeah. and not sound busy. It's a good way of describing it too, because he does move around, but it <clears throat> it sounds sparse. It never sounds. Yeah. chilled up or too too much yeah. and and i'll just say steve you know i i saw these guys from the first gig that they did together on and it's it was like you guys had been playing together forever it was so locked in from the first night with the two of you guys it was really really good really the whole band was for just a couple rehearsals or even one rehearsal you had it was well, who are you talking about the marauder brothers band marauder brothers yeah oh, yeah yeah but i mean i have Great. to say that it's the closest to steve uh, playing with Steve is playing with Jerry. I mean, when I played with Steve, it was the same thing for me. I never, ever had to think. We never had to think, well, am I, are we in the same slot? It's, let's call it a slot. And that's the thing. Sometimes if you play double drums, there's a slot. Like if Will were still on, he, will, he would tell you, I think what he was saying earlier was that actually, that playing with the two drums, it, two drummers is not easy for a bass player because you just... There's the slot, and if you there's a if there's a crack in that slot, you're not nothing's going to work right. And, and I think with with Steve, uh, there was always that we always kept that slot. And with Jerry, there's the slot. You know, when two guys play like that, I used to love to watch Keltner 
and um, and Jim Gordon when, oh, when yeah. he did Mad Dogs and Englishmen. To me, yeah, that yeah. was the epitome. And I once went up to Keltner early on. Right, this is when I first met him, and I said, "You guys sound amazing. You have, you're so much alike." And he looked at me and he went, "We don't play anything." Else. And I realized he, in his inimitable way, I love him. But you know, that was when I first met him. He was totally right. They didn't play alike at all. But when they got on stage, it was like this. Well, he's probably yeah. got that Jerry kind of thing too, where he's coming up with inside percussion stuff. Yeah. And Ooh. but his feel is so deep that it, it works. And so yeah. is Jerry's. Uh, his his pocket is just like just like the way you think of it. Just like the way I think of it. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like. Uh, if I hear him play, it's it's like man, I want to. That's the groove I want. That that's the groove that's right for the song. That's the groove I want to be able to play for that song. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I Whatever. love that. I love hearing guys play where I got where I think to myself, wow, I wish I got to play that. And sometimes it's literally bass drum on one and three, snare drum on two and four. That's it. And I'll hear that and I'll go. Oh, yeah, that, boy, I wish I had played on that. I mm. wish I played, that's like, that. I'm gonna play that song just cause I wanna play that and feel like that. I mean, I was so happy playing the fewer notes um, that were possible to be played. Me too. But Steve, with Steve, he can do that. And yet when he has to go play something like Night Sprite or, <laughs> <laughs> or 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 that break in Leprechaun, Asia, yeah. Or, yeah. 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 A, any of that stuff, it's like crazy on the money. And that's when I remember when Steve first did that. When I first heard that record, I called him and I just I didn't even have words. And all he kept talking about, and to this day he still does. It's the same thing. It's one of the most amazing things I ever heard. And he always talks about, yeah, Anthony sounds great on that, doesn't he? Meaning Anthony Jackson. You know, yeah. Anthony was, you know, all I have to do is this, the Anthony, and we're just reading this. It was one chart. It was like all over the place, but it was, well, it was, he was reading the piano part or something. And I'm like, there's, that's the stuff that, that a Steve Gadd does. That just, that's, I call it inventive. It's like, in, it's an interpretation of something that no one is going to do that. Who's going to play that break in Asia? On a, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a rock and roll song. But granted, that band, you know, but if you read, there was somebody, I just read a long, uh, wrote a long, long article on Steely Dan and the, 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 the lyrics and things of Steely Dan. I mean, you can analyze those guys in so many different ways. When you're in the room, it's just music. It's just music and music. Who's going to play that on a rock and roll album, on an album that's going to pop, yeah. pop album? But Who's you know what's crazy? I heard it yesterday on on the bridge on on Sirius Radio, and I hear it a lot. And it's it's you're right, Rick. It it like it it defies all other sort of uh, not logic, but but that's one of those songs that you would think who's gonna play, but but you hear it on the radio because it's such an amazing piece of music, and and it as as muso as it is, it still has like this almost I don't want to say commercial, but you know what I mean. It's 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 so kind of widely universally accepted by people. Uh, a, I think that I think that the reason they had uh, they tried different drummers on it was because they had a hard time communicating how crazy they wanted it to be at the end because it it went against the grain of what I was trying to do as a recording musician was like, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was get busy. You know what I mean? We were talking about trying to keep it simple. Everyone was trying to do it in those years. You know what I mean? And for yeah. them to try and get someone to go completely the other side, I mean, you know, I couldn't think of anything else to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I mean, it's like yeah. that's the only thing I could think to, to do other than what had already been done, you know, so. Um, so they left that space wide open for you to just, just solo, just play, yeah, it was, it was. Yeah, they had, they were gonna put, I had no idea they were gonna, they put Wayne Shorter on after, you yeah. know what I mean? So, but they yeah. had this vision 
of what they, I, I, no one said they were going to put Wayne on it. You know what I mean? So I didn't know that. Well, I was just trying to read the chart. Did they know? I don't, do, are you sure I, they knew I, they were? I don't know. I think they, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking they had a vision of what they want, how they wanted it to, to grow. And, uh, and maybe if they had said they were going to put Wayne on it, it would have made, it would have been easier to communicate. Uh, maybe they said that and I didn't hear it. Or maybe they didn't know, you know what I mean, until the end. I'm not sure. Or maybe they thought if you if they told you that, you might do it some other way that I, I, it, I would it kept your mind free. Of somebody it, you know? get a hold of Donald and just say, <laughs> you know, he'll probably remember. But my, if, it, if, 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 if it were me thinking, I would think Steve played this and they would have gone, because I know those guys. They, I could see Donald and Walter sitting in a room. I don't know if this is what happened, but I could see them going, shit, you know what would be great? Some crazy, weird, like Coltrane-esque, put, put, put some sort of solo, let's put a sax solo on there. I mean, they're that nuts. Because mm -hmm. you know what? They were so used to throwing stuff out. They would try anything, and it could. they would be no problem looking at you and going, it's the weirdest thing that we look to and go, yeah, that really doesn't work. You know, it really is. Oh, that's terrible. I don't think you should even ever play that. <laughs> but, but they, I could see them, I could see their brains going, oh, you know, it'd be because they had such deep vision about certain things and other things. I never understood what they were thinking. Honestly, I never, there were times I couldn't understand, but on that record, first of all, who's going to do that? back then, other than Steve Gadd, and get away with it. Peter Erskine, maybe. Maybe, I mean, I don't know if he would have done it, but, you know, Peter was, I only knew, those Those were the two best of those kind of players back then, were Peter and and and, and, and Steve, because they played with Steps Ahead. To, they both played with Eddie Gomez. They both played with with Grolnick and Mike Maneri, you know, and they were, they were they, they could play solos and, and lyrical solos. I just think that I just can't talk enough about the that song because look at Steve's coming out of this incredibly simple, you know, playing on the tom tom, very wide open, and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, I think kids got was, some moves. That was huh? The kids got some moves. That right. Gad kid. What were you going to say, Steve? Sorry. I was going <laughs> to. I was going to say, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me check. All right. Well, yeah, it's all right. We're we're going to wrap it up in a second. I promise you'd be an hour. Um, but I do want to I do want to make this uh, announcement: the Steve Gad Band live stream Saturday, November seventh, five p.m. Eastern time, two p.m. Pacific. 10 p.m. in the UK, 11 p.m. in Europe. And Steve, is this correct? It's the only Steve Gadd band appearance for 20, 2020 and 2021 at this point? Yeah, That's what, so far. yeah. So far, okay. So it's a, it's a live stream uh, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna post Wait, this. Is this. Is this November, what is this? Uh, 7th, it's, which would be three weeks from today, Saturday, November 7th. Rick, well, I have your date, hold on. Book. Let me check my check book. Your book. Check your book. The book. The uh, the website for ticket information is live.champion.biz, B I Z, live.champion.biz for tickets and other information. Get on it right now. Um, and I'm going to post this uh, promo poster on my Facebook page after this. I tried posting it here, but it won't let me while we're doing this, but I'll post it in a little while. Um, Anyway, yeah, so that's that. And there's also, uh, Steve is going to be doing something for Drumhead Magazine and more information coming on that. And Rick is going to be on Drummer Hangs in the UK on Saturday, November 21st. And that's, I don't have the time on that, but that's through, Russ Gleason does that. Steve, you've been on there and, and Rick, you've been I'm on there before. I'm doing it because Steve did it. When I saw Steve was on it, I called Russ and said, hey, how come Steve gets to do this and I don't get to do it? How come Newmark gets to do this and I don't get to do it? And he said, well, we might have a slot for you in 2022. 
but someone dropped <laughs> out because of COVID, and I think that there's an opening now. Yeah, stuffed me in. <laughs> so, so if that that the uh, the drum hangs on the twenty first. I'm just basically going to talk some more about Steve that day. So what's <laughs> may as well. I think Russ is Russell Steve, probably yeah. gets Russell gets Steve to come on, and he'll take up the whole time talking too. Uh, you, but but anybody interested in that, and you should be, should go to Russ Gleason's Facebook page, and he'll have all the information on that, how to sign up for it. And uh, and I just got a text a second ago from Dave Maddox, and I was thinking about Dave Maddox. Love Dave. Um, yeah, I love Dave too. And we were talking about Rick. You were talking about, and we'll wrap this up in a second, but. The person that came to mind, and I got to have Dave on one of these very soon, um, whether he wants to or not, because he's a very humble guy. But um, when you were talking about playing like one and three in the bass drum, two and four in the snare drum, just to like a mm, set, I've seen Dave play with um, local bands. He lives here in the Boston area, and he was playing this club regularly for a while, like on Wednesday nights. And a couple of times I caught him, and, and to me, he like, He's like a great example of somebody who can play that simple beat and it you you just can't stop moving your feet. It just feels so amazing. Talk about a, a touch and a feel. Um, so yeah, it's it's and then you know, I'll go home and try to play the same thing, of course. And I sound like I'm playing with sledgehammers, but that's another story. For another tell time. Say hello to David from us, man. Tell him we say hello. I will. I will. I think he might be watching. So, Dave, if you're watching, the boys say hello. Um, guys, anything else you want to close out with? We we got a lot of stuff covered, but as usual, not enough. Russ Gleason says 2025, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just if anybody wants to go listen to something really great. Steve, a great Steve Gadd performance that you might not have heard. On, um, he did a song with Carly Simon, um, You Belong to Me, yeah. with Mike McDonald. And I had to play that live. And it was not a walk in the park. So if you want to hear a great drum part, somebody who took something like Will was talking about earlier, James Jameson doing uh, Heard It Through the Grapevine one way, then doing it completely different the other way. So Steve takes... Um, uh, you belong to me that the Doobie Brothers did or that Mike McDonald did and he does his version of it with Carly and played just to give you the, the, the headlines so break it down he's got at one point if I can remember right he's playing quarter notes on the bell of the high on the bell of the cymbal he's playing upbeats uh, disco type upbeat with his left hand on the open and closed hi-hat and then coming down and making this hitting the snare drum on two and four, and with his right foot, he's got a complete different pattern going on, and it all falls into this incredibly musical, great drum slot. That's that's my push for the day, my end of the day, go listen to a Steve Gadd track. A great song. Yeah, somebody had mentioned, um, mistakenly thought that Steve was on um, Nobody Does It Better, which we know was Jeff, rest his soul. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and I think Nick Vincent asked about vengeance, but I, was, I thought about you belong to me because that's that's so Steve. It's got that same, you know, you, you can you hear that. I recognize that. You know, Steve I started and... practicing that again because before COVID, I was on my way to Carnegie Hall to do the Carly Simon tribute. And one of the tracks we were going to do, and I think Mike was going to do it, was you belong to me. And I had done it on the road with Carly for a long time. And it was for me. It was one of the best things I got to play during the course. Of the, you know, playing with Carly, interesting was a lot. There's a lot of good drum stuff in there, but that was one of the great grooves in the Carly Simon thing. And the other Andy Newmark fills and the Jim Gordon fills are really great. But always remembered that that groove from 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 Steve was totally unique, completely great, and incredibly hard to play. You yeah. see Carly up there. You see her in the vineyard. Uh, I actually am supposed to see her this week. I haven't seen her in a long time. She's been locked up at her place, but she just hadn't, I guess I could say this. She had a, a knee replacement this week. Oh. So she's coming. She's still in the hospital. She's coming back. I'm supposed to go see her. Blue came by today, and uh, we're supposed to go see Carly this week. All right. Say hello. Man. I will. Yeah. Hey, real quick question before you guys go. A really good question came through from a friend of mine from Mexico City. 
Um, and he was asking um, if you could share with, with everybody a mistake that you made growing up as musicians. I, maybe that's too long a, an answer to have to give right now, but if there's a, a quick answer, you could, it, it's a general question, like a mistake you might've made in a session, a mistake you made picking the wrong drum heads, choosing the right representative, anything you want to say. Go ahead, Steve. Or, you made a lot not. of mistakes. You got to have one at the top of your. <laughs> I, 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 um, Agreeing to do this interview? That's a big, that was kind of. Yeah, a, the fact that, we, yeah. Um, in here right now, the stick click in Asia. No, that wasn't, that was, uh, yeah, that was a mistake. That was, that was a mistake. I'm just kidding. Uh, though. That's. Um, Well, you know, like one time I, uh, you know, like I use a metronome to count off songs for different people. And you, the drum tech, uh, you know, makes sure that all, all the, that the, that the, that the metronome's in order and that the t tempos are right. And, uh, you know, and one time it wasn't right. And I counted off the song with the tempo that was written down, but it was actually the wrong tempo. So that was, uh, I mean, that's, that's a mistake. You know what I mean? That, but it wasn't uh, your fault though. So, well, uh, yeah, I mean, sure, I, I, it was up to me to really check on all that stuff. So it affected the way the whole thing started. And then we had to start and stop and count it off again. And, um, Another time I was uh, working with uh, Artie Garfunkel and, um, and I had some percussion. I had some kungas on stage because we was doing, you know, some percussion, I had shakers and stuff. And uh, I don't know, I, I must have tripped, I must have gone to sit down and, and, and stumbled. <laughs> but, but the kungas, everything went flying. <laughs> I mean, it was like, it was, uh, you know, it was unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. So. Um, I thought what it, I, a good one. I thought what he was going to say was, his mistake was, I once did a gig with Artie Garfunkel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rick, you're up. No, I've never made any mistakes. I mean. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it was the worst mistake. I, 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 honestly, I don't, I don't, I'm sure I've made so many. I'm sure I did while Steve and I played together. But one of the things, the faux pas of all time that I remember, and it's apropos of Steve being here, was I was playing, I was touring with James Taylor. And on um, one of the tracks that we did, I used to bring up this little a la, and, 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 and Steve will know this, a la Ralph McDonald. I put this little table together of a, of a bell, a little bell, that, that, that I hung, you know, those little finger symbols that I hung on the, on the table and I had a wood block and I cut a, a hanger that I would tap the wood block with. It was incredibly sensitive and these really great little shakers and it was really quiet and it was one of these sensitive songs and it was just me and James on stage and I'm standing behind James and we we're playing either, I don't know where we were playing, one of the sheds maybe or I could have been anywhere and Carnegie Hall shed, I don't know. And we're playing, and, and, and as we're playing, I tapped and tinkled and did my little thing, you know, and I sort of made a face. And people in the front row start looking at me. And I'm going, no, you know, and I'm playing like quarter notes on the, on the, on the wood block. Order notes on the wood block, little cowbells up there, ding, ding, ding. And people started to get a kick out of it, right? <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, this whole, this series of like the first 10 rows are looking at me like it's a comedy show. And I'm doing things like this. No, stop. No, don't, don't look at me. Look at him. And, it's, and James turns around and looks at me, does this. It's the end of the <laughs> End of, this, end of the whole thing, we're in the dressing room. Go inside, he goes, what the fuck was that all about? <laughs> Is it the Rick Morata show? 
<laughs> you know, it was like it was one of those things where you know, people start laughing. You know, it's like you're in class and you start laughing. And you can't stop. Yeah. And the wave and it took over. And it was one. Of, I wish I could remember the song um, because it was one of those songs that was no laughing matter. There was no. nothing funny about the song. I'm being yeah. really sensitive and tinkle, and it must have this burly, hairy guy going and doing maybe I made a face or I did something and, and oh, all of a sudden everybody thought everything I did was hysterical and James said I don't think we need that part on this song anymore <laughs> there's no laughing on stage oh. at a James show no it's, a, it's a <laughs> oh that's funny that's well that's good we'll, we'll end it on a on a high funny note right okay all right great to Listen. see you Steve Good to see you, man. I'll talk to you. Thank you to John to Christopher for for picking me up uh, from my 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 hospital visit in, in Boston two weeks ago. That's why I got bamboozled into doing this thing, what John. Are you talking about a hospital visit? I had a slight. I had a little uh, procedure. What? Um, well, let's tomorrow. put it this way. He. There'll be no more little Rick Maradas running around now. <laughs> oh, Dr. No, I'm kidding. Stop. I'm kidding. Dr. Stop? <laughs> no, I, uh, I had a, uh, a little, little procedure. I've been meaning to call you and tell you. I, I actually called you before I went in, but when you called me, in fact, I owed you a call. I, was, I don't even know what the hell I was calling. Oh, I know what I was calling you about. James Cena. you got to get me off that. I, I, already, I already spoke to him about it, man. I don't know. <sighs> It's going to be very difficult to get you off that list. Unbelievable. Almost impossible. He but said Steve was on the impossible. list. Now you're on the list. Impossible. <laughs> impossible. <laughs> impossible. <laughs> Jay knows what we're talking about. All right, I'll see you guys. Thanks a lot. Right, it was a great don't time go here. yet. I'm going to. I'm going to sign off. I'm going to hang on in the room for one minute. Who? I'm going to end the stream. You just, guys hang. Yeah. You just want to talk to Steve, not me. I you, want to talk to you both for one second. That way? What? <laughs> All right. Hang on. Hang on one second, you guys. I think I can do this. Maybe I can't. I hope I you hang know. up on me. <laughs> right. Hang on a second. I'm going to I'm going to put you back in the waiting room. And All right. Thanks, everybody. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it as half as much as I did. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Over and out.